Welcome to Beyond ASC 842, Lease Accounting Compliance, What Companies Should Know, presented by CoStar and FEI. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to share some information regarding CPE credits with you. I appreciate your patience. Today's webinar is worth one CPE credit. Please be sure to enable your media player to hear audio. To be eligible for CPE credit, you must answer at least three of the four, four polling questions and have a total viewing time of at least 50 minutes. Participants will have the opportunity to download their CPE certificate, certificate immediately following the webinar if above requirements are met. In accordance with the standards for the National Registry of CPE Sponsors, CPE credit will be granted based on a 50-minute hour. We are unable to grant CPE credit in cases where technical difficulties preclude eligibility. CPE program sponsorship guidelines prohibit us from issuing credit to those not verified by the technology to have satisfied minimum requirements listed above. I encourage you to download today's presentation, which is located in the resources widget on the left-hand side of the screen. After the presentation, this webinar will be available on the FEI member site, where you can replay and download. At the end of our, the webinar, you can retrieve your certificate in the certification widget in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Below the resources widget is the Q&A box. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, and the presenter will answer as many questions as he can. And now it's a, it is FBI's pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Matt Waters. Mr. Matt Waters is the Director of Lease Accounting at CoStar. He's the former Lease Accounting Manager with Home Depot, six years, and the American Tower, 100,000 plus leases. He is CoStar's subject matter expert with more than 15 years of management experience in accounting and finance. Welcome, Matt. Hi, thank you, Susan. This is Matt, and uh, thank you for the the brief on uh, CPE credits. I know we all love receiving those. Um, you know, I, I started out uh, just like many people uh, on the line here uh, with an accounting degree and studying for the CPA exam. And I actually remember studying about lease accounting, and it was a brief section in the, the book that I used to prepare. And I actually remember enjoying it, uh, not because it was that interesting, but because it involved the Bright Lines test that we all became familiar with uh, under the previous guidance. And um, those, those four Bright Lines tests were kind of easy things to memorize. And then I figured I would um, I would memorize and if the question was on the exam I would get it right and then never use that information again um, but um, but you know that's uh, I guess famous last words because it has turned into a um, a uh, career path really um, and I, I started out uh, I took a, a new job back in 2005 and um, at, and that was with American Tower and uh, they uh, called me up in my first week on the job and said, Matt, fly to Boston. Uh, I was starting in the Atlanta finance office, but they said, fly to Boston where our lease records are kept and, um, and analyze a stack of leases. So I got up to Boston. There was about a four-foot stack of leases on a desk, you know, in the middle of this building next to the, the you know, quote, lease library. And... Uh, and I sat there for a week and, and figured out if these leases were capital or operating leases under what we called then FAS 13 or ASC 840. Um, and then from that point in 2005, um, I, I continued on to Home Depot, uh, worked on lease accounting there. And now for about the past uh, three and a half years or so, I've been with CoStar and uh, with the, the big change in, in guidance to ASC 842 in the U.S., uh, we've been helping hundreds of clients make the transition and comply with the, uh, with the new guidelines. So today I want to talk to you about um, what's 
commonly referred to as day two or beyond compliance, you know, because uh, really there, there, there was this compelling event that, uh, you know, the new accounting standards that requires clients to comply and, um, and, and put leases on the balance sheet. Um, you know, however, there are many things uh, to consider for day two, you know, including remeasurements, um, workflows, uh, things that happen uh, when you terminate a lease, uh, when the auditors come to visit. Um, and so we want to talk about some of these things today and, and really provide some, some considerations for uh, what happens after you get through the basic compliance event. Um, we'll talk about some of the operational insights, um, and then um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about the differences in real estate and equipment leases. Uh, that's that's been a big topic as we've rolled through this um, this initial wave of, of companies uh, that that had a uh, the first deadlines to comply with the standard. Uh, we've seen that that many companies had a, a a good handle on real estate equipment uh, was was not always quite so centralized, um, and then now we're seeing a move towards centralization. So we'll talk about that. So first, we'll we'll talk about um, just the the fact that the the initial project is very complex, and I'll give you some brief lessons learned on that. Um, but again, the the day two accounting or the um, the, the going forward um, practice of, of lease accounting, and it is going to continue. And and I, I brought that up in, in my own story, you know, that I've been working in lease accounting since 2005, uh, you know, and, and almost exclusively during that time, uh, just to illustrate that, that this is something that uh, we will work on and, you know, continue um, well into the future, and um, you know, I, I like to think of it that if we had simpler guidelines, you know, less stringent requirements, at least on the balance sheet, in the past, and now we've we've kind of uh, complicated things with the the balance sheet treatment under ASC 842. Uh, certainly, we we'll uh, continue to work on lease accounting and have um, in, in large. Corporations, you'll have a lease accounting department. Um, you know, in, in smaller companies, at least you'll have one person probably who is a, a subject matter expert and responsible for lease accounting. So, uh, it's important to think about what happens on on day two and beyond, and set yourself up uh, for success. So, just a, a quick summary of ASC 42. You know, the, the big news is that uh, virtually all leases need to be recorded on the balance sheet. And you set up a right of use asset, a lease liability, and you start to amortize those leases with very few exceptions. Uh, the exceptions being uh, short-term leases, you know, less than a year, uh, immaterial leases um, that are, um, that are low dollar uh, value leases. But pretty much uh, you could you could generalize and say all leases need to be reported on the balance sheet. Um, there's some, some complex rules involved and some nuances, so you, you do need to have expertise um, either in-house or, or consult with experts um, at, a, at a minimum. And um, there are practical expedients to consider as you, as you prepare and, and um, adopt the new standard. Um, and those, those practical expedients uh, can, can greatly reduce the amount of effort and uh, the complexity of the transition. Um, now, one thing we're seeing also is the organization of leases into groups or portfolios. I've been talking about this quite a bit lately, especially with the equipment leases coming online. Um, and this just streamlines the um, uh, the adoption of the standard and, and kind of simplifies, although it's not always the best case scenario um, and, and really gets down to a policy decision uh, for each individual company. And, uh, and I put materiality on this slide too because that's something that, 
that FASB did not uh, give a threshold, you know, or a specific amount. Um, internationally, the um, IASB uh, provided a $5,000 threshold for materiality. FASB just offered a, a general statement that um, materiality uh, can be a consideration, and so companies are setting policies around that. Now, um, I'm not going to to read this slide here. Um, this is a high-level overview of the steps to go through to comply with lease accounting. Um, and uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll provide a link um, and a, a screenshot that you can you can take note of. Uh, where you can download this list and, and many other lists on the CoStar website. Um, and, and this just helps, um, helps think through, make sure that, that all of the steps are complete as you get started on a project or, or perhaps if you're getting close to the finish line and you want to use it as a checklist to make sure you've thought of everything, that would probably be helpful as well. Now, this slide, um, lease accounting transition failure rate, you know, it's a, a bit of a uh, ominous sounding slide, um, but we have heard from experts that um, up to around 25% of lease accounting projects uh, have, quote, failed. And now, as I'm sure you can imagine, there are various degrees of, of what people consider failure. Um, and uh, a, a lot of this is, is stemming from the, um, the, the solutions that companies have selected, uh, software solutions. And we're, we're getting feedback that uh, while some solutions can, can calculate the initial opening balances, perhaps, um, perform some discount rate, net present value calculations, and, and approximate the um, the lease liability and the right of use asset, uh, some solutions are not able to handle all the nuances involved uh, with lease accounting. Um, and so, you know, while um, I, I would say most, most companies are able to get across the finish line, uh, really I think failure, um, you know, could be along a spectrum of how much manual work do you have to do? You know, how much how much Excel work uh, does your team have to do, or, or how much do you have to pay an external consultant to come in and um, and patch uh, what you've put together? So um, I'm happy to say at CoStar uh, we have helped hundreds of companies cross the finish line with lease accounting compliance. Um, all of them have been successful, and um, and you know that's just a uh, a factor of of how seriously we have taken this standard for for years and years, even in the exposure draft phase. Um, you know when the exposure draft came out um, originally, I was at Home Depot and I I got requests uh, you know for updates um, in all levels of the organization, even to the audit committee on the board of directors. They're asking what will the impact be to Home Depot's balance sheet, and and you can imagine it was it was a massive impact. Uh, but during that time, we started looking at solutions, and uh, CoStar really rose uh, to the top of my list because they were taking it very seriously even back then during the exposure draft, and and they have refined the product since then. Uh, so um, I think a factor that being um, a major factor that experience. Um, has has really helped us serve our clients well, um, but again, the it is a quite a uh, sobering fact to see you know uh, that that up to around 25% of of lease accounting compliance projects have have uh, have been considered a failure. I think Susan, that brings up our first polling question. Okay. Our first polling question today. Which of the following best describes your company and status for ASC 842 lease accounting transition? Private company working on transition, public company with late reporting and working on transition, public company already successfully transitioned, 
public company that should be transitioned but project experience failure or having trouble finishing transition. We'll give about 10 to 15 seconds for this first polling question. Please be sure to submit your response in the submit button. Okay, we're going to switch to the results. Hey, Matt, back to you. Great, thank you. Okay, excellent. So I see that we have um, the, uh, the largest group here, private companies working on transition, and that, that makes a lot of sense just because the deadline uh, for private companies was a year after the public company deadline. Um, and then we have a, a pretty uh, decent group of public companies with a probably a fiscal year, um, which makes sense. Um, we've got some public companies that have already successfully transitioned, so congratulations to those folks. Um, and just a few that uh, that have experienced some trouble uh, transitioning. And um, and you know, so we have seen uh, we have seen some of that. You know, unfortunately, and, um, and even even here at CoStar, we've um, we're helping a lot of private companies get started now, and and we also are seeing uh, the need already to um, people asking for us to replace a solution that they put in place. You know, and it, you know, it could have been that it was a interim solution uh, that was never intended to be permanent, or or in some cases it was a you know a um, a, a system used for lease accounting that was less robust, and now um, and now the companies are deciding they need a a better tool essentially. So we're we're seeing some come to us now uh, with a request to re replace a system already. So again, we're going to talk today uh, in detail about some of the considerations beyond basic compliance and. Uh, the, the items on the screen now are, are the the, um, the ones that we'll talk through. The uh, need for opening balance adjustments, uh, what happens when you have a lease renewal or a termination, uh, when true up entries are required, and we'll talk about accounting workflow and audit trail, um, and, um, and then we'll touch also on month-to-month -month leases and some, some operational insights. So starting off, we will discuss the opening balance adjustments. Um, so the, um, this really this starts with transition, but it actually doesn't end there. Um, and, and what I mean by opening balance adjustments is, is really uh, the opening right of use asset adjustment. Uh, the lease liability side of the equation is always based on um, the net present value of future payments, and um, you know it's just a factor of that stream of of cash flows that you um, that are dictated by the lease, and then um, and then the discount rate. Uh, typically, in practice, that's the incremental borrowing rate. Um, so that that makes up the lease liability, and there's there's really no way to change that other than the uh, by changing your rate or changing the the cash flows, and so adjustments are made to the right of use asset, um, and um, and so for transition, if you're transitioning from ASC 840 um, in an operating lease scenario, you you had straight line uh, where the uh, the rent was essentially smoothed out or straight lined over the term of the lease, and the difference between cash rent and straight line rent was held in a balance sheet account, usually called the deferred rent account. Uh, now to transition to ASC 842, that deferred rent balance uh, becomes a opening adjustment to the right of use asset account. And, um, and we've seen some, some struggles there um, with, um, 
with, with some solutions that do not allow that opening uh, asset adjustment, um, we, um, we, we recommend that you use that. CoStar has that functionality. And, um, and the reason why I bring it up in this context is uh, transition from 840 to 842 is not the only scenario that will require an adjustment uh, like that. Going forward in day two, uh, if there is a, say, a commission involved or other direct cost, uh, that's an opening uh, right of use asset adjustment. And, um, and it, really, anytime you have a, a prepaid or an accrued item that happens before the inception of a lease, you need to adjust that opening right of use asset. Uh, so this is, this is functionality that you'll need uh, both for transition and going forward in certain scenarios. Um, so it's it's very important to consider as you're um, as you're setting up your uh, your policies and and selecting a solution to uh, to move forward with. And Susan, I think that brings up our second polling question. Okay, second polling question: What aspect of lease accounting compliance are you most concerned with? Gathering all the leases and finding all the embedded leases, proper separation of lease and non-lease components, inaccurate key assumptions and variables, or something else we haven't discussed yet today. We'll give about 10 to 15 seconds for you to respond to our next poll. Okay, here are the results, Matt. Okay, thank you. All right, so about half of our participants are most concerned with gathering all leases and finding all the embedded leases. And uh, that's rightfully so. That's been a, a challenge that we've seen um, in kind of a trend that, uh, and we're advising people that Gathering the the, uh, the the full population of leases is something that almost always takes longer than you think it should, and um, and we just advise everybody start as early as possible on your project, um, and and start gathering information, and that's something that's called out in in the white paper. Um, that again, I'll I'll have a slide at the end that will give you instructions on how to obtain that. Um, Lease and non-lease components are second, um, and yes, that's that's been a, a really, um, really big exercise for some people. And uh, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, this is one where there's even a practical expedient around. You know, sometimes you can choose to combine lease and non-lease components and treat them all as lease components. Uh, sometimes that's an advantage, and sometimes it's not, and it's really case by case. Um, the key assumptions and variables are concerning um, also just because there are so many. You know, th there are um, requirements under AC 842 that aren't necessarily new. Uh, for example, the requirement to determine if you're reasonably certain to exercise a renewal option. You know, it's really language that was there all along, uh, but it didn't make quite as big as, of a difference. Um, on the financial statements under ASC 840 that it does under ASC 842. Um, just because if you're reasonably certain, for example, to uh, exercise a 10-year renewal option on a piece of real estate, uh, that can dramatically increase your right of use asset lease liability. Um, whereas before, it, it might have made a just a marginal impact to your straight line expense. Um, so, um, Again, the, those key assumptions and variables, and, and there are many others to consider, um, are, are certainly a concern. Now, for um, as we continue our, our our discussion of 
um, of day two accounting or or the go forward considerations. I put a, just a, a list in here, and I I got this straight from ASC 842, and you can see the reference there. Um, but these are the examples from ASC 842 of lease modifications. Um, and uh, this is only for a lessee. I did not even include the, the examples for a lessor. And this is from, from you know, the FASB um, document that uh, I think is, is 400 and something pages. Um, and as we know, I mean, the, they, they decided that, that these were the key examples to provide, but, but as we know, um, there are many other scenarios typically that, that we come up with in practice that, that uh, FASB does not include specific guidance for, and that's why we have these, um, these other practice guides um, that, that uh, most accounting firms uh, have and make available on their websites, and, and those end up doubling or tripling the number of pages. Uh, but I, I just put these in here to say this is the kind of the bare minimum um, number of, of uh, examples that FASB wanted to provide, and then you can you can literally find dozens, maybe hundreds more in, in the practice guides that are out there. Um, and you can see a modification that's accounted for a separate contract, um, uh, modification that increases the lease term. You can have a change in lease classification under that. You can um, you can have no change in lease classification. You can have a modification that gives an additional right of use, um, modification that decreases the scope. Um, in the case that a scope is decreased, you can um, account for that in two different ways. Um, and then you can have modifications that change lease payments only. And again, I, I think really in practice this, these examples barely scratch the surface of the potential um, changes that might need to be made. And I bring that up just to just to illustrate that um, these these day two or, or ongoing accounting considerations are are super important to consider as you're setting policies and and uh, selecting a software solution for lease accounting even. Um, so just to to roll into a example, and, and this is one of the ones uh, from from the uh, guidance that was on the previous slide. This is just a, a simple lease renewal. Um, and it, in this case, you would have steps, um, you know, and, and just thinking about this from a, from a software perspective, um, you know, the, to get the um, accounts payable process correct and then the uh, general ledger um, accounting correct, uh, there are many steps that will need to be performed. So first, really, the, the lease admin team um, or the, the team responsible for abstracting leases would go in and make the actual change uh, to the lease abstract and uh, change dates and dollars and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and then we'll pick up there from an accounting standpoint and talk about uh, what the accounting team needs to do. Uh, the t accounting team reassesses the classification of the lease. Um, the accounting team would remeasure the lease liability based on the remaining lease term um, and the incremental borrowing rate at the effective date of the modification. Um, the increase in the lease liability should be recorded as an adjustment to the right of use asset. And uh, this generates a one-time extra journal entry. You know, so in addition to your monthly uh, amortization for this lease, you'll have one, um, one um, change that needs to be made to the balances probably in this scenario. And, um, and typically there's not a income or loss on this type of modification. The difference is spread out over the remaining term of the lease. Um, but there's, you know, there's math involved in that. And, um, and averaging out that change over the term of the uh, lease from that point forward and, and impacting the various um, accounts, you know, the balance of right of use asset and the ongoing um, straight line expense or level expense for an operating lease, um, the balance of the lease liability um, is a, a pretty complex exercise. So uh, 
events that occur like this and, and that we all know will occur in the future, this really has motivated a lot of companies to select a, a robust uh, lease accounting software uh, that can handle uh, these types of changes. Because um, this is not something that you want to do very often in Excel, um, you know, or, or, or have to perform a manual calculation in, in more of a calculator type software. Uh, you, you really want automation around this because it, um, it occurs pretty frequently. And again, a lease renewal is about as simple as it gets. Uh, there, there are many other more complex examples, you know, including some of those that, that FASB called out, uh, like a change in a lease, a, a decrease in scope um, that, uh, that maybe only partially reduces, um, reduces the amount of square footage you use or, or, um, or the number of pieces of equipment that you need or something like that. Uh, those scenarios get even more complex than this. One more example that I'll go through today. Again, super common. Um, it's a termination and uh, something that, that happens all the time. And, um, and really, the, a similar set of steps to the, the previous slide on, uh, on the renewal you know, the, the lease admin team would, would still be involved in changing the lease abstract and the, you know, the, the payments, the AP payments would be affected by this. And then the lease accounting team would need to go in and perform all the steps we talked about earlier um, in, in modifying the lease um, and the amortization schedule and there would be journal entry impact. Um, and then there are some other considerations around termination fees. Sometimes there's a a fee that uh, the, the lessor um, requires if a lessee terminates early. Um, and so you have to factor that in. Um, and sometimes it, it might need to be expensed um, or written off to a, a loss account immediately. Um, sometimes uh, if it's a termination that's happening in the future, um, you know, reasonably certain, those words come up in this context too, if you're reasonably certain or, or become reasonably certain because of a major event that happens, uh, you become reasonably certain to use a termination option, uh, you, you may actually need to project that termination fee sometime in the future and then it becomes part of your level expense every month for an operating lease. Um, so something to consider there and, uh, and solution a uh, software solution for lease accounting should be able to handle both of those scenarios. And then ultimately, um, in many cases, there's a, a gain or loss associated with the termination. And that, um, that adds a little complexity around the, um, the journal entries because in a, a normal course of business, lease accounting journal entry, when you're just amortizing a balance every month, you, you don't have a gain or loss. Uh, so this this just requires the, um, the software um, or, or your process to pivot and, um, and have a, a special case journal entry for a termination event um, and, and for, for many other types of, of transactions. Again, I'm, I've just touched on two very simple examples here that happen all the time, renewals and terminations, uh, but there are, are a, um, a number of other events that require um, similar and even more complex calculations to be performed. And um, some of those are listed here. This, this is not all inclusive, uh, but you can have a partial termination. Uh, you can have an impairment. Uh, FASB has said that the right of use asset is subject to impairment testing. Um, and so that, uh, that triggers a specific track of calculations that need to be performed and a journal entry that would need to be recorded. Um, the interesting thing on impairments is that the pattern of depreciation of your right of use asset changes um, if you have an operating lease and, and it becomes impaired. Um, you actually have to change your, your expense pattern related to the um, depreciation or or your amortization of that right of use asset. So um, something to, to consider there. Um, if you change your set 
your assessment of uh, items that you said uh, are or are not reasonably certain, um, you know, you, you would have to perform a remeasurement. Um, if, if you have to comply with IFRS, IFRS actually requires uh, changing or remeasuring your schedules uh, with a change in the CPI index or, or other index driven escalation. Uh, so that's a concern for, um, for companies that operate internationally. Uh, sometimes you have data corrections, um, just um, corrections of, of either errors or, or incomplete information. Um, and, then, um, and then many times leases are renegotiated and, and just you know, changing um, economic environment, you may get a better deal on a lease and renegotiate and that, that requires a, um, an adjustment as well. Okay, and I, I should mention, you know, largely speaking to a, a group of accountants here, I, I'd say we are all familiar with a uh, true up entry, um, and and this happens just uh, more more often than we would like, but uh, it's just a reality in month end close because we need to close the books um, in a certain number of days. Um, inevitably, somebody on the um, on the real estate team or the procurement team or uh, or whoever uh, you're dealing with in the business executes a lease or uh, or. Um, changes something on a lease or renews a lease and we don't find out about it until after the books are closed for that month um, and so really uh, you know not just in those scenarios but any of the the items we've discussed the um, the remeasurement events that we've discussed uh, could potentially need to um, occur um, as a true up entry meaning that it the change actually happened in the past. We've already closed that month um, in our general ledger, and we need to we need to book the impact of that. And we're not going to open up a previous period. Uh, we're going to record the difference in what was recorded in the previous period and what should have been recorded as a true up or, or an adjusting entry. And so, um, in in our software at CoStar, we have what we call a retrospective adjustment option. Um, so if you, if you backdate a change to the accounting schedule, um, it will recognize that journal entries have already been posted for that period, and it will uh, automatically calculate the true-up entry, um, which, is, which is really a, um, and we've seen this used already, you know, we're, we're only we're not even halfway through the year here with, um, with companies that were first uh, to adopt the standard, and we've already seen this used pretty extensively, and it's just the nature of the business. Um, leases are complicated. Um, there, there is a process involved. Negotiations are involved. And the accounting team, unfortunately, does not always get uh, timely information, and so this functionality around retrospective adjustments or true-up entries uh, has, has proved very valuable. And Susan, I think that's uh, our next polling question. Okay, this is our third polling question. What is your company's current status for selecting a software system to manage data and perform ASD 842 accounting calculations? We have a proven system already up and running. We've identified some options and are evaluating them. We're interested in finding options to review or we believe our Excel spreadsheets will do fine for our needs. We'll give about 10 to 15 seconds for the third poll. Okay, Matt, here are the results. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, pretty good mix here. Some have already have a system up and running. Some are in the evaluation process. Uh, some are interested 
in reviewing options, and then we've got a, a fair number, 20% uh, here, that say Excel will meet their needs. Um, and, and that, you know, that is a perfectly um, reasonable approach. I'd say um, hopefully uh, that group only has a handful of leases, right? I mean, there is a, there is a, um, a spectrum, I'd say, where, you know, if you have two leases in your company, uh, you, you can knock this out in Excel. And they don't change very often. Just hammer it out in Excel, uh, no problem. But there is a there is some magic number of leases, um, you know. Certainly, after you start to get into the hundreds of leases or thousands of leases, uh, you would want to consider having a software solution. Um, and um, and certainly, there are companies in, in uh, on all all levels of that uh, spectrum. All right. So, moving on, uh, another area. Uh, that I think will become very valuable as we consider the go-forward practice of lease accounting is the accounting workflow. Um, and so really this gets into some software functionality uh, that, that basically it, help, it helps you enforce your policies uh, around separation of duties um, and, and ultimately just provides for a more efficient uh, flow of information through your company, and um, and so some items that I'll point out here is that you'll get quick and easy visibility into how many leases are pending review, pending approval, or approved um, at a glance. And so, you know, this is really just um, in, in CoStar we call it a um, an accounting dashboard, but um, but the approvers or, or really anybody uh, who uses the system can log in and see the status of of, um, of where leases fall in the approval process as they as they flow through your levels of review, um, you can customize the number of approvals and roles needed. Um, you know some some companies would just want to have um, you know a preparer and an approver. Uh, some have a supervisor. You know perhaps in between a um, you know the the staff accountant. And the manager, there's sometimes a supervisor, so an intermediate level of approval there. Um, so that can that's important to allow that flexibility. Uh, status reports on demand, you know, this really uh, helps in managing, especially month-end close. Uh, you you want to know at the at the touch of a button, you know, and easily refresh, you know, where are we in our close or a pre-close process as far as getting leases or or um, amortization tables approved, um, date and time stamps of changes um, are, are key to document, um, safeguards, so uh, you want to be alerted if something has changed, so perhaps you're at the end of month end close, you, you have everything approved, you're ready to, um, to basically cut off um, lease accounting for the month. Um, you would want to be alerted as soon as something changes, you know, if you need to make uh, one last tweak because of a, a change to a lease or something like that. So having those uh, automated is, um, is, is nice to have for sure. Um, and then um, system reports um, really uh, can, can come in handy and, and, um, and I think uh, something that's super valuable is an ad hoc reporting tool that can um, that can integrate these these workflow status uh, indicators and, um, and and pull those into ad hoc reports because inevitably uh, you're going to get into you know six months down the road and uh, you'll get a request uh, from a department or, or perhaps the um, the controller's office or the CFO's office. We want we want this. Um, information every month, and the ability to, to drag and drop with an ad hoc uh, reporting tool that's integrated into your system can be quite valuable. Um, now another um, item that's, that's really important, and I think this goes hand in hand with the, with the workflow management, is the audit trail. Um, and um, a really, a, a quality system will provide an audit trail, um, you know, and not not just tracking 
you know, clicks and and data entry in a in a flat file, but you really you really want something robust uh, that that uh, provides a a nice display. Um, and and we've even seen it at CoStar. We've had some clients ask us to give their auditors read-only access, uh, so that that can really uh, speed up the flow of information when your auditors come to visit. Um, you know, and and some do not do that. Some some just appreciate the ability to run reports uh, that can quickly and easily uh, walk the auditors through um, the information they need to conduct their audit. An example of this is the disclosure report. Uh, disclosure report under ASC 42 has gotten uh, much more complex, and um, and there are things that are required such as the weighted average discount rate across your entire lease portfolio um, and the weighted average lease term. And, and these are not calculations that are quick and easy. Um, and so, um, it, for example, if you, if you run the disclosure report um, in CoStar, you'll receive the, uh, the face of the report that looks almost exactly like FASB uh, prescribed in the standard. Um, and, and includes every key point that um, that, are, that has to be required, and then uh, the uh, tabs behind that uh, will include all of the supporting detail by lease, including these calculations that are very complex. Um, and so you can uh, you can use that to quickly and easily uh, provide an auditor the detail behind um, the. Um, what's on, presented on the face of the disclosure report. Okay, another consideration that, um, that I hear people talking about quite often uh, involves month-to-month -month leases. And so some leases are, are just inherently month-to-month. -month. You know, you, you sign up and you, you pay for the, you know, it's the greatest level of flexibility. Um, now, uh, some of these will will most likely be considered short-term leases that m you know, many many companies are electing that option that FASB provided to not uh, track those on the balance sheet but just expenses incurred. Um, however, there are some leases that that are long-term leases that switch to month-to-month -month status um, uh, when they uh, reach the end of their originally negotiated lease term. Uh, so if you fall into that category, it could be a situation where you're not sure you're going to renew after that and you just keep it month to month. Maybe it's a, uh, it rolls into short-term status at that point. Or, or perhaps you are reasonably certain uh, you're, you're going to renew this um, and these month to month payments uh, actually do need to become a factor of um, the right of use asset lease liability. And, um, and you need to make an adjustment there. So uh, again, this is something that requires a lot of flexibility going forward. And um, if, if you're in the, the category of folks evaluating software solutions, uh, make sure that you can roll into and out of month-to-month uh, month, month lease status uh, with ease. And now I think we have our last polling question. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. Our last polling question today. How does your organization plan to interact with auditors for ASC 842? We've discussed our project plan and policy with our auditors already. We plan to review our project plan and policy with our auditors. We are getting accounting feedback from other internal or external sources and will interact with auditors during the audit, or we're not sure yet. We'll give about 15 seconds for this last poll.
Okay, here are the results. Okay, great. It looks like the largest group have already discussed with their auditors, and that's uh, that's actually what we recommend um, to um, to draw up a policy and then um, and then show that to the auditors. Make sure you're on the same page um, as you walk through this process, um, and then you know, certainly uh, getting getting feedback from other uh, industry experts um, is a great option as well. So another aspect I wanted to touch on today is just the, the differences between real estate and equipment. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of companies had robust uh, policies and, and even, even departments in place to manage real estate, uh, but then uh, equipment has been more dispersed or you know siloed across many organizations uh, where um, individual operating units or even individual locations had the authority uh, to execute a lease and it just uh, was was uh, was paid and expensed on the p and l um, and and largely that was that was acceptable under a c a forty now it might not be uh, so we're seeing a, a huge push toward uh, centralization around equipment leasing practices. Um, the data gathering exercise that we touched on earlier is, is crucial to that. Um, a lot of folks are considering the portfolio approach, which is a, um, a term for a expedient that's, um, that's offered in the standard that uh, you can group up similar assets um, and, and typically, I see this done when there are similar start and end dates. Um, you know, an example might be a, a group of, of telephone leases. You, you lease every handset. You know, you certainly would not record each one of those, or, or wouldn't be advantageous to record each one of those individually with separate amortization schedules, um, because all of those phone handsets come into your um, office at the same time and they leave at the same time when the lease is over. Um, so FASB said as long as there's not a material difference in accounting for uh, the group as a whole, you can go for that. Um, as long as there's not a material difference to accounting for individual assets uh, separately. So a lot of folks are taking advantage of that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people uh, set up a, a, um, a shared service center or or group this in with their shared service organization, um, this equipment leasing. Uh, some are calling a, a center of excellence around equipment leasing or, or just leasing in general. And, um, and it's important to remember that um, even though real estate leases have traditionally changed pretty frequently, um, you know, in many cases, um, equipment leases can change even more often than that. And, uh, you know, things can for example, a you know land um, is there is not going to be destroyed or or, <laughs> or taken off uh, very frequently for things um, that happen outside of your control. But a a truck or a car, if you lease a fleet of vehicles, those individual vehicles could be uh, damaged or wrecked and have to be uh, switched out. So just something to consider as you as you move forward with tracking equipment leases. Um, and then the, the operational insight comes into play. Um, and it really is, you know, this, this process of collecting all lease data is, is pretty arduous. Um, but in the end, I, I just wanted to give a, a bit of a silver lining. And uh, from my personal experience, when we started doing this at Home Depot, um, it was painful. We, we had to go out and, and find all of these leases. But we did end up um, adding money back to the bottom line. And, and the example um, there is that we, we had just thousands and thousands of forklifts. Um, but then when we started tracking the lease accounting data and, um, and really tracking on an on a asset by asset basis, we realized we, while we had, say, 10,000 forklifts, uh, we, we were paying for 15,000 forklift batteries and um, and that just um, that just happened over time, and 
uh, the, the vendor had just forgotten to take the batteries off of our bill when they replaced one. Um, and something that uh, was very easy to miss uh, on a granular level, but then when we rolled up, we were able to spot that trend and, and realize that we needed to uh, have a discussion with our vendor about that. So again, just one small example of a efficiency that you can pick up uh, through this lease accounting uh, compliance exercise. Now, um, getting close to the end here, I, I wanted to give you this word of caution. Uh, this is pretty current. You can see this letter from the AICPA is dated uh, about a month ago, and uh, they're expressing concern uh, to the FASB about the, the private or the non-public company deadline this year. They're saying we may need some more time, and they're they're angling for an extended deadline. You know, time will tell if we if we get that extension. But um, but they point out that. Uh, some of the third-party vendors, you can see in the red box, that have developed solutions to assist companies in implementation of the lease accounting standard have errors in their software, and it will take some time to sort through and to ensure these solutions are accurate and auditable. Um, so, you know, this is just something I wanted to point out as something that's risen really to the, the highest levels in the accounting profession. Um, you know, not all software solutions are created equal. Um, you know, but again, here at CoStar, we've taken this very seriously for over a decade now, well before the standards were issued. We were preparing for this, and we've helped hundreds of clients uh, successfully comply. Um, so I just um, urge you to consider um, taking a, a, a look and, you know, use, um, use the process of evaluating software uh, to, to see robust demos, even you, you can even ask for a sandbox, you know, if you'd like, um, at CoStar we always offer the option to, uh, to give you a sandbox to, to try your own scenarios in, uh, so you know you're, you're, you're getting exactly what's promised. Um, now here, as, as I um, indicated earlier, uh, we have some resources on our website, CoStarManager.com. And these are just two examples of white papers that are there. Uh, these include the 12 steps that I mentioned earlier and many more lists, including lists of uh, sometimes hard to think of, you know, obscure leases, maybe help you identify those embedded leases. And, um, and then other, other white papers are available there with, with just other things um, uh, to help you as you think through your project and, um, and how to get started. Or, or, yeah, again, just maybe if you are well down the path, just help you uh, make sure that you've thought of everything. So now we've received a few questions, so I'm going to pull those up and uh, run through as many as I can in the remaining minutes. Um, the first one um, relates to uh, the portfolio approach that we talked about earlier. And this is where you, it says, are there disadvantages to using the portfolio approach uh, for long-term accounting practices? Um, and the portfolio approach, again, is where you group up like assets and use essentially, and from a software perspective, you end up with one amortization table uh, for a group of assets instead of individual asset amortization tables. Um, you know, it's really a case-by-case -case decision about what makes more sense for your company. The only disadvantage to using that is if uh, the the assets uh, change frequently or, you know, come in and out, out of service frequently, it might be better to, um, to use the individual asset option, um, especially if they get out of sync on the start and end dates. Uh, then it just becomes... Um, inefficient, I'd say, to, to group up into one portfolio. Uh, but again, it's just something that is an option. Uh, we can, we can at CoStar, we can do it either way. Um, here's another question. Um, are there other things retailers should know about the new standards and how they affect long-term leasing operations? Um, and about to wrap up here, but the biggest thing from a retailer perspective is that uh, some had these gains on sale leasebacks. Um, we've seen some 
uh, if you, basically, if you have a gain on a sale leaseback, definitely talk that over with your auditors and your advisors on how that'll be reflected because that that has sometimes a dramatic impact on your your go forward accounting um, and your um, expense going forward. And I think that's about all the time we have. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Susan uh, to close out. Thank you all. Hey, Susan? I think maybe Susan has dropped off, but, um, but I know, as she mentioned, she'll provide these slides. Um, and um, also, if you answered all of the questions, you'll uh, receive instructions about CPE credit. So uh, thank you, everybody. I've enjoyed talking with you today, and I hope you have a, a great rest of the day. Demand analytic tools, expert advisory services. You have reached a non-working number at CoStar Group.